She looked the part of an elderly nursing home patient as paramedics wheeled her into the hospital. There was little fat or muscle separating skin from bone, and her nightgown hung on her shriveled frame like a flag on a pole. The paramedics lifted her on a thin bed sheet with very little effort from the gurney onto the ER bed. One of the medics acknowledged me as I entered the room and asked, Doc, are you ready for a report? I nodded while putting on a pair of gloves, and he said, this is Mrs. Johnson. She's 89 years old with a history of advanced dementia. Staff at the nursing home went into her room to bring her dinner when they noticed that she was unresponsive and struggling to breathe. She has a fever of 101 and an oxygen saturation of 72%. I introduced myself to her. Mrs. Johnson, I'm Dr. Vu. But her eyes remained closed. A gentle shake on the shoulder yielded no reaction. I resorted to a vigorous sternal rub with my knuckles, which elicited a guttural moan. Her arm shifted on the bed, but there was no strength in it to bat my hand away. Enough functioning neurons to feel pain, but not enough to do anything about it. When I shined a light in her eyes, they sat indifferent in the hollow of her skull. The wrinkled skin on her face, the texture of weathered papyrus. I pushed aside the oxygen mask to look into her mouth. Her lips were dry, and they stuck to her teeth the way old bubblegum sticks to the underside of a table. Her breathing was shallow and rapid. I placed my stethoscope on her chest and heard the wet crackles of alveolar sacs drowning in fluid. Her frantic heart galloped and kicked the inside of her rib cage to escape. We removed the diaper and rolled her over onto her side. A pair of kissing bed sores the size of tennis balls glared at me as though I had uncovered an illicit tryst. A woman in her late 50s entered the room and waited patiently by the bed while I finished my exam. When our eyes met, she said, I'm Mary, how's my mom? While removing my gloves, I informed her, she's very sick. I think she has pneumonia. I fear that the infection may have spilled into her bloodstream. How long has she been in the nursing home? Mary responded, about a year. Ever since dad died, her dementia has gotten worse. She was living with me, but wandering out of bed at night and falling. Her agitation got so bad I couldn't take care of her anymore, so we placed her in the nursing home. She paused for a moment and took a deep breath before continuing. She fell again and broke her hip six months ago. She suffered a stroke during surgery and has been bedridden since. Her mother's decline is not uncommon for someone with progressive dementia. I followed up with another question that I already knew the answer to. How would you characterize her quality of life at the nursing home? She said, poor, very poor. Mom was an architect before she retired, an avid reader, and sang in her church choir up until she was diagnosed with dementia. She loved to sing. Mary paused and her voice cracked when she continued. Now, she can barely feed herself and doesn't even know her own name or recognize who I am most of the time. I nodded in recognition and gently asked, how aggressive do you want us to be with her care? She looked at me as though I'd asked a trick question. What do you mean? The trajectory of our conversation was enough for me to know that my next patient would have to wait a little longer. I pointed to the chair next to her mother's bed and asked if she wanted to sit down. When she did, I leaned into the bed rails with both hands. With her mother lying motionless between us, I explained, 
she's really struggling to breathe and her oxygen levels are critically low. She has very little reserve and it's unlikely that she can have survived this. We can be very aggressive and insert a breathing tube and hook her up to a breathing machine. If her heart stops, we can do CPR to try to revive her. I'm just not sure, given her poor quality of life, if that's the right thing to do. Have you ever talked with her about what she would want in this situation? Mary leaned forward on her chair and held her mother's hand before responding. Well, we've kind of talked about it before dad died. I know she wouldn't want to be on life support forever if there was no chance of survival. Absolute scenarios rarely apply in medicine. I couldn't predict how long she'd be on life support for, nor could I say she has no chance of survival. Medicine is rarely black and white. It lives in the gray. When Obamacare was debated, there was a provision to incentivize physicians to discuss these nuances with patients and their families. The opposition labeled it the death panel and effectively killed the conversation before it got off the ground. When my siblings and I sat down with our parents to have this conversation, I asked, what are the things that if you lose, no longer make life worth living? My mom loves family gatherings and telling stories. She loves to cook and feed her grandkids. In other words, she loves Thanksgiving. <laughs> Take Thanksgiving away from her and she'd rather die. When we talk with our parents about death, we learn what it means for them to live. Apparently, my mom loves to wipe her butt <laughs> because she made it very clear that no one else is to do it for her. <laughs> and she's terrified of nursing homes. Death can be a sudden process, like when a 20 year old dies in a car accident, but death can also be slow and insidious. Sometimes it's hard to pinpoint when the dying process began. Instead, it may be easier to ask when the living ended. So when dementia or a stroke makes it so that my mom no longer recognizes family, when she physically can't talk and can't cook, when a stranger wipes her butt and God forbid does it in a nursing home, that's when I'll know she stopped living. As for my father, I don't think he said a word. All we know for sure is that he loves to garden, play Chinese checkers, and watch Fox News. <laughs> As he sat there next to my mom, nodding and agreeing with whatever she said, I thought, he'll stop living when she dies. I concluded our conversation by asking my parents, how do you want to die? Well, that was easy for my mom. She said, Kong Dao Di Mao, which in Vietnamese literally means no pain, go fast. Mrs. Johnson remained motionless in bed. The only sign of life was the slow, subtle rise and fall of the white sheet draped over her chest. My tone softened as I looked at Mary and asked, if your mom is able to communicate with us right now, do you think she'd want us to put on a ventilator or let her die naturally? You mean like not do anything? She asked. I understood her trepidation and explained, well, we can give her antibiotics and fluids. Best case scenario, she recovers to go back to the nursing home. But if she dies, we can ensure that she passes without any more suffering. That's a more natural death than dying hooked up to a ventilator and us compressing her chest and breaking ribs when her heart stops. Mary nodded weakly and said, I understand what you're saying, but mom is a devout Christian. I'm not sure if I can let her die without a fight. 
When confronted with religion, my best defense is logic. I said, I think God accepts that we all die. I think he is mostly concerned with how we live. My gaze shifted from Mary to her mother. If I could wave a magic wand and give her another year, another year of being in the nursing home while the sores grow angrier, another year to fall and break the other hip, another year to be afraid of shadows in the night, another year of not knowing her name or recognize the face of her own daughter, I'm not sure how living this way would serve God's purpose. Tears welled up in Mary's tired eyes, the turmoil evident in the tremor of her hand as she ran her fingers through her mother's hair. Sprinkles of dark gray hair fell limp onto the pillow like dead soldiers on a battlefield. Mary's eyes then fell to the floor, no longer looking at me or her mother. She cried, I just can't let her die. I can't. Please do everything you can to keep her alive. I cannot be upset with Mary. Her struggle is not unique. Even though I've had this discussion with my parents and I'm confident that I can implement the Kong Dao Di Mao plan, will it be as straightforward as I imagine it will be? Which one of my six brothers and sisters will have trepidation? The great philosopher Mike Tyson once told a reporter, <laughs> everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. <laughs> I explained the process of intubation to Mary. In order to do it safely, I'd have to give her mother medication to paralyze and sedate her because having a tube in the throat can be very uncomfortable. She nodded and left to go wait in the waiting room. I inserted a breathing tube into her lungs and connected it to the ventilator. Another tube was placed in her stomach and another into her bladder, ensuring that when she dies, it would be anything but natural. A nurse escorted Mary back into the room, filled with the rhythmic swoosh of air rushing into plastic tubing and the monotonous beep of the cardiac monitor. I left that room thinking, Medicine is very good at prolonging suffering. About 30 minutes later, Mary wanted to talk with me again. When I entered, she said, I just got off the phone with my son. I told him everything you told me, and he thinks we should let her die a natural death. He agrees with you that she suffered enough. So does that mean you want me to remove the breathing tube and withdraw support? I asked. She nodded weakly, yes. Doing so would almost certainly cause her to die. She said, I understand. I just don't want to see her suffering anymore. I wanted to scream. But my shoulders grew heavy and my stethoscope was a noose around my neck. What would have been an act of omission by letting her die naturally without the tube became an act of commission by removing it. With the former, I'm more like the country doctor who makes a house call to provide comfort to the dying. With the latter, I'm more like Jack Kevorkian, the same physician who was convicted of second degree murder for giving a lethal injection to his patient with terminal ALS. Euthanasia or mercy killing is illegal in the United States. Physician assisted suicide, on the other hand, is allowed in 11 states, including California. A physician can prescribe a lethal dose of medication but the patient has to take it on their own. A layer of distance between the physician and the act is the difference between compassion and confinement. 
At the intersection of cynicism and physician burnout is a pool of self-doubt. And in my darkest moments of sleepless nights and self-reflection, I plunge headfirst in this murky pool and ask, am I Jack Kevorkian? If I wanted to sleep well, I picked the wrong profession. <laughs> but this is not about me. It is about a daughter's struggle to make the right decision for her dying mother. It is about a child's responsibility to a parent. Just as our parents had the duty to provide a safe and nurturing environment for our entry into this world, so is our obligation to ensure a safe and nurturing environment for the exit out of this world. Safe from a healthcare culture that sometimes prioritizes futile treatments over dignity and quality of life. I learned through the years that my job is less about saving lives than about reducing suffering. So I deflated the balloon that held the breathing tube in place and withdrew it from her throat. I wiped a trail of drool from the corner of her mouth with a towel. Her nurse wrapped a warm blanket around her body like a cocoon with only her face exposed. The agonal, guppy breathing that comes in the final throes of death can be difficult to watch. So I administered a dose of morphine, more so for Mary's benefit than her mother's. I leave them alone, a daughter and her dying mother. No noise from the ventilator or cardiac monitor to break the silence. Just grief and acceptance to fill the void. Thank you. Jay Vu, ladies and gentlemen, Jay Vu.